Hello, everybody. Welcome to the European Resuscitation Council Young Investigator Award session. This is for the Pettersteen Award, which is for the best young physician researcher. We also usually have an Ian Jacobs Award, but there weren't any suitable applications this time. So for all you non-physician researchers who want to get you know, get a presentation and an opportunity to present their work. Look out for the Ian Jacobs Award next year for our next Congress. So moving on, we have a panel of three judges. I'm just going to get them to introduce themselves. So Jerry. Thanks, Jazz. I'm Jerry Nolan. I'm chairman of the uh, ERC and I'm also uh, an anaesthetist and intensivist from Bath in the United Kingdom and I am chairing the panel. And Sandra? Hi, I'm Sandra. I am a physician in anaesthesia from Copenhagen, Denmark. And Cornelia? Hi, I'm Cornelia Jenbrugge. I'm an emergency physician in Brussels in Belgium. Okay, great. Thank you. So the format of this session is going to be that our three speakers, the three young investigators, have all pre-recorded a talk, so we're going to show that. And then at the end of the session, the judges and you, the audience, will have an opportunity to ask them questions. And if you look on the conference website, there's a Slido where you can type your question. Those of you who are watching live on YouTube, you can go to the Slido app and just type in the event code, which is B482. So that'll give you an opportunity to ask questions and I'll look at the questions and ask them. So our first contender is Alexis Steinberg. She's a neurocritical care physician in Pittsburgh, USA. And she's going to speak about physician decision-making regarding neurologic prognostication after cardiac arrest. So thank you, we'll see the video. Hi, my name is Alexis Steinberg and I am a neurocritical care attending at the University of Pittsburgh. The title of my talk is Physician Decision Making Regarding Neurologic Prognostication After Cardiac Arrest. My main research mentor is Dr. Jonathan Elmer, who is also at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center with me. I believe that physicians are at the heart of neurologic prognostication and that they play a role at each step of prognostication and something that I would like to further study. The three main questions that I'm interested in are, how do physicians actually go about formulating a prognosis? What are the situational and, fi and physician factors that affect prognosis formulation? And how do we make this process better? Sometimes I feel like my job is emulated by this picture. Recently, I did a retrospective multicenter study that's not yet published, and I showed that 25% of inpatients' deaths occur because of perceived poor neurologic prognosis. As many of you know in the audience, withdrawal of life-sustaining therapy for perceived poor neurologic prognosis is the most common proximate cause of death for post-cardiac arrest patients, indicating that physicians very frequently are involved in this process and plays a huge role in terms of formulating a prognosis and making treatment decisions. One of the first questions I wanted to ask was, how okay are physicians with making mistakes? In order to do this, I did a multi-center, uh, an international survey. One of the first questions I asked was, you perform a test that predicts a 50-year-old previously healthy patient will not awaken from coma. Family has told you that if she would not awaken with good functional outcome, she would not want long-term life-sustaining therapy. Thus, you advise withdrawal of life-sustaining therapy with a transition to comfort-oriented care. If the object is to never make a mistake, then life-sustaining therapy can never be withdrawn because no test is perfect. What is an acceptable error rate in this scenario? So the scenario that the patient would have recovered have life-sustaining therapy been continued. The results of this study were as followed. Physicians felt that an extremely low false positive rate was acceptable in this scenario. So majority of physicians felt that an acceptable error rate was less than 
I asked a similar question, um, but instead flipped the scenario on the head. Instead asked, what is an acceptable error rate in the scenario of recommending continuation of long-term life-sustaining therapy in the, when a patient has never has a chance of waking up? In this case, physicians felt that there was still a low acceptable false positive rate, but it was higher compared to the previous scenario, so less than 0.1%. So physicians play a role in formation prognosis because their ability to make errors is very low in this scenario. Test features also clearly play a role because it will change how physicians interpret that data and then how that funnels it into prognosis formulation. The next question I wanted to ask were, how accurate are physicians even at formulating a prognosis for post-cardiac arrest patients? In order to do this, I enrolled physicians who take care of post-arrest patients within the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Whenever a patient would arrive to the hospital, I would then find a physician and ask them these five questions. The physician would have real-time data, and they were able to ask me any questions they wanted about the patient because I had full access to the electronic medical record. The first question I asked was, will the patient survive to hospital discharge, yes or no? How confident you are in your prediction? And they were able to choose between 0 and 100%. Do you think the patient will have a favorable functional outcome at discharge? Once again, choosing yes or no. How confident are you in your prediction? once again, choosing between 0 and 100%. And then my last question was, if asked by family today, would you recommend withdrawal of life-sustaining therapy, yes or no? I did a total of 470 assessments, and this was uh, post-cardiac arrest, either from, where, from day 0 to day 5 or until the patient had died. And what I found was that Physicians were accurate 66% of the time for predicting survival and 74% of the time for predicting good functional outcome. Most, most interestingly was that the majority of errors, so over 90% of errors, were because of optimistic errors. So the physician predicted that the patient would have a good outcome when instead they had a bad outcome. Not surprisingly, physicians were more accurate when they were more confident, but confidence only explained very little in terms of the variance of accuracy. One of the most interesting things that we found was that there was substantial between provider variability. So the median odds ratio was somewhere between three to five for predicting either survival or functional outcome. And the, this variability that was seen was not able to be explained by our measurable provider level factors, so experience or background specialty, or explained by time since arrest. So given that their physicians are not accurate and there's significant amount of variability, I wanted to study further in terms of how the physician goes from seeing a post-arrest patient to formulating a prognosis. And most specifically, I really want to focus on experts in the field. In order to do this, I did a qualitative study where the first step was I created a model based on the ERC guidelines and the AHA guidelines. Based on that model, I then created and performed open-ended questions to probe experts and general providers about their approach on prognosis formulation. Initially, I did pilot interviews with five local physicians at the University of Pittsburgh who all partake in our post-cardiac arrest service. I then used a reiterative process to refine our baseline model, our interview structure, and our codebook. Next, I interviewed experts and general providers internationally. Majority were from Europe, then followed by North America and one from Australia. I did a total of about 40 different interviews. Myself and another person double coded all interviews until we got a Kappa score greater than 0.8. Initially, we used deductive methodology to code higher level and subsidiary nodes, and then use an inductive methodology to further alter the model. And these are the results of my interviews. So overall, the process is quite complex. At the center of this process is this very reiterative process. This came up multiple times. So physicians go from acquiring data over here to interpreting data to formulating a prognosis. At that point, sometimes they'll make a treatment decision, but many times they go back and feedback into acquiring data. 
and that at each step of this entire cycle, there are many different factors that play a role in terms of their ability to formulate a prognosis and the steps that are involved with it. The weights of the arrow corresponds to the cumulative frequency that these connections were brought up within all of the interviews. So higher weighted arrows means that the connections were talked about more frequently. When you take away the less frequent connections, this is the simplified model that you get. So once again, we have this reiterative process. And it looks like there are several factors that play a huge role. MD factors being at the center of it that affect mostly formulation of prognosis, but do affect each of the other steps. Time and hospital factors also play a huge role. Test features play a role specifically at the interpretation of data. And then integration of information also play a role specifically at the formulation of prognosis. My future interest research will be mostly focused at this intersect of MD factors at this entire process. Given this, I wanted to kind of go through a few themes that came up quite frequently within the MD factors. One of the biggest things that themes that came up multiple times was this theme of the physician being intrinsically patient. So my approach is attentive procrastination or neuroprognostication, procrastination. Physicians talk about intrinsic biases playing a role. So my prognosis was influenced by either personality or values. There were many themes related to professional norms and how that plays a role in prognosis. And then many physicians discussed um, their intrinsic views on patient age. So overall, factors beyond diagnostic tests themselves play a role in neurologic prognostication after cardiac arrest. A main factor is physician factors, and these are poorly understood and not discussed in guidelines. More research is needed to understand these physician factors that play a role in the entire process of prognostic formulation so that we can improve the entire process. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can you um, let me turn my video on? Oh, it says the host won't let me turn my video on. That's okay. I'm I'm hoping you can hear me, Alexis and Jerry and Sandra. Yes, just loud and clear. So I've got the same problem as. Uh, okay, that's good. Yeah. Um, and Cornelia. Yes. Excellent. So thank you very much for that uh, talk, Alexis. Uh, I'm going to get Jerry to ask you some questions and uh, some questions are coming up on the, on the uh, chat link as well from the audience. So Jerry, fire away. Alexis, thanks for that um, very interesting, very clear presentation. It, this is obviously a fascinating topic. Um, you, as I understood it, when you went out for the sort of international experts, you were looking at experts by definition. So how much do you think you can extrapolate your findings to, to the average clinician? Because presumably these experts were going to be very knowledgeable about guidelines, and etc. Yeah, so um, the start of this was experts where we did about 20 experts. And then we used the snowballing sampling, um, which I haven't I didn't fully go into it in the videos where each expert had to give me two quote unquote general providers. So someone who didn't meet the criteria for experts. Um, and then I actually did those same interviews with them. Um, and the models, when you look at the models are actually quite similar. So the overall models are quite similar. I'm going through a lot of that data now because this project took me a very long time. Um, the themes become quite different. Um, and so the, when you get very, very down into the themes that are brought up, um, they are very different between experts and general providers, depending on who you sample as on your general provider. Is it someone who works alongside an expert? And so in the US would be considered a large academic center or would be it's some more of a community physician that gets a little bit different. Um, and it's hard to tease out in a qualitative methodology just because you would need so many patients and it's a very time consuming uh, process. Thanks, and, and I'm not an expert in qualitative research, but um, was it 
possible based on the number of um, subjects you, you kind of investigating. W were you able to pick out whether some of these differences were more down to things like base specialty of the person or, or do you think personality was the stronger explanation for variation? Yeah, so in qualitative research, they say you need about 20 to 30 interviews but of subgroups to actually make a good uh, comparison. I didn't have enough for a subspecialty. Um, most of my people who I interviewed were um, intensivists or anesthesiologists and then neurointensivists. And, um, but I, was, I do have enough to compare Europe versus North America, um, mm -hmm. which that will come out. Um, was next, that was going to be yeah. my first. <laughs> <laughs> um, and becomes very fascinating. Um, and then um, general providers versus experts. So those are the two analyses that I'm currently doing right now. Um, okay. And there's more to come. Okay, thanks, Alexis. Um, Jazz, I'll hand back to you for the, in case the other judges have got questions. Uh -huh. Sandra? Yes, so thank you, Alexis. I have a question from the beginning of your presentation where you ask the different groups what they would accept as an error rate. You had quite a large group saying, Errors doesn't matter. Um, Did you dive deeper in, deeper into that, or is that unknown? What lies beneath that? Yeah, when you look at it, it's actually so. We sent this survey out to neurologists, um, post arrest, uh, different post arrest foremans, and then palliative care. Um, most of those people were actually palliative care physicians, um, and so this ties into this whole idea of professional norms playing a huge role in decision making. Mm. And then I have another question because you say physicians. And so when I look at my daily practice, I of course do what you're saying here, but I rely heavily on my nurses' observations. So yep. did you think about that? If, yeah, we if it's a physician only job? Yeah, no. So there's definitely a huge integration. And this comes up actually in my interviews quite a bit um, about multidisciplinary teams playing a role in prognostication. Uh, one thing I would like to do is actually do, they, and they've done this in different um, other realms of neurocritical care, but actually asking nurses to prognosticate um, because I think the bedside nurse plays a huge role in either clinical nihilism or optimism. Um, and I think that needs to be further teased out, but I have yet to do that. Yes, because I think this is something we learned about weaning from ventilation, for example, that we need the nurses. They actually know quite a lot more that we don't because we don't stand bedside all the yep. time. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, Cornelia, questions? I have only a small question. Just do you have any information? Is there a difference between younger and older physicians? Um, for, so when I looked at accuracy, mm -hmm. um, they're actually younger physicians or um, less experienced physicians were more slightly more accurate than more experienced physicians which to me plays into, so um, I didn't go th into this into in my talk, but this whole idea of heuristics and poorly cal calibrated decision-making. And so to me, this is kind of a sign that maybe expert physicians have poorly calibrated um, decision-making and kind of ties in this whole idea of self-fulfilling prophecy. But that was one of the interesting things we found. Yes, okay. Great, thank you. I, I think I was one of the younger physicians that uh, Alexa yep. thought so for this <laughs> uh, I've got some uh, questions from the audience. So the first one's from Laurie Morrison. And is there, is there a difference between those of us in Europe with those of us across the pond in North America? Yeah, there are a lot of the models. So I'm going through the data now. The models look to be similar. So the big the nodes that are brought up are quite similar. When you get down to themes within those nodes, those change quite a bit. Um, the biggest thing that is quite apparent when you go through all the interviews is that Europeans talk a lot about protocols and how the usage or the implementation of protocols has maybe reduce physician biases and physician factors that play a role. That theme doesn't come through as much in North America at all. Um, and mostly because um, less physicians in North America actually had protocols when I probed them kind of about those questions. That was the big difference. Great, so the, the next question was from Tobias Kronberg and it's a similar question. He was asking, did, did the use of an algorithm or having an algorithm affect decision-making? you know, and factors and things. So, can you... 
yeah, I can expand more on that. So that's what physicians believe. One of the issues with um, qualitative research is, or one of the differences in qualitative research between quantitative research is that it's much more of a hypothesis generating type of research. This is very exploratory. And so this is what physicians feel happens. The question I think becomes, does the implementation of algorithms actually reduce physician biases? And so that would be a very interesting, for me, an interesting thing to study further on, um, just because that was a very prevalent theme that came through. Um, so, but it was brought up quite a bit. Okay, thank you very much, Alexis. Um, we'll now move on to our second uh, young investigator. It's uh, Yusef Azali from Catalonia in Spain, who's a pre-hospital emergency physician. And his video lecture is going to be on walking towards personalized CPR. Thank you. Thank you very much for your invitation to participate in this session. My research career has been focused so far on how to improve cardiac output during CPR and how to improve sudden death outcomes. I have recently received my PhD on the study of incidence and risk factors of CPR injuries and their hemodynamic adverse effect. In the next 10 minutes, I will try to explain why I think it is important to work towards a more personalized chest compression performance and ventricular fibrillation treatment. I have no conflicts of interest. I am the principal investigator of the RECAPTA study. We have received funding from the Catalan Resuscitation Council. I am from Tarragona, a very nice region of the Mediterranean area, with a good weather for the practice of tennis sports. As a regular tennis player, I hope that this lecture will lead, like in a good match, to a good set of questions in this case. We are facing many challenges in resuscitation research. One of the main is the drop-over time of cardiac output, even with the use of mechanical chest compressors, impairing the benefit of new treatments as ECMO. The chest compressions is our tool to produce cardiac output during CPR. That's why it's so important to optimize them. In our simulation model, we can see the movement of the sternal hinge and how the costal cartilage is deformed but it is the anterior axillary line of the ribs which has a higher risk of fracture. The human ribs biomechanics behavior is depicted on an elastoplastic force displacement curve. A rib fracture produces an elasticity loss. Recent data highlights the need to maintain the elastic properties of the chest during CPR. A higher chest compression release velocity was associated with higher probability of survival. A drop of chest compression release velocity was larger among women and older patients. The guidelines aims to balance the benefit of increasing chest compression death against the risk of causing harm. On one side of this balance, it was described a higher incidence of CPR injuries with more than 60 millimeters of chest compression death. On the other side, a large study reported that maximum survival was associated with chest compression death between 40 and 55 mm. Not without this caution, the last guidelines established between 50 and 60 mm the recommended death of chest compression for an average sized adult. Concerns about the one size fit all approach for CPR performed by specialized teams are growing. Another study has assessed the optimal compression death. It has been found an optimal chest compression death of 47 mm, associated with a higher survival. Older individuals appear to benefit from a shallower chest compression death, but differences were not significant. We have more data available to assess the benefit of the chest compression death than data to assess the risk. We have some definition to assess the risk of harm, such as life-threatening injuries, serious ribcage damage, serious visceral damage, and major traumatic injuries. These different definitions, with a wide range of incidents, makes it difficult to assess the real risk of harm of CPR injuries. In order to help with this, we have introduced the concept of serious CPR injuries with an adverse hemodynamic effect. 
we review and analyze this issue using the Campbell diagram, highlighting the need to preserve the elastic properties of the chest to maintain the key negative intrathoracic pressure during the decompression phase. Now let's talk about some results of the RECAPTA study, which is a prospective out-of-hospital cardiac arrest registry including multiple sources of information for the study of sudden cardiac death. It includes a specific protocol for the study of CPR injuries. We studied the incidence of injuries due to manual CPR. We found that 63.3% of non-survivors presented serious ribcage damage. The median of rib fractures in this group were 8, and 87% of the cases presented bilateral fractures. Regarding the CPR injuries risk factors, the ones more commonly described are the age, female sex, duration of CPR, and death of chest compression. But in our study, thanks to our specific protocol including the anthropometrical variables, we found risk factors beyond the classical ones. In our multivariable regression analysis, the chest circumference greater than 101 cm was the only risk factor associated with serious ribcage damage and female sex was the only one associated with serious visceral damage. These findings fetch us the importance of the chest geometry over other risk factors. But why does it happen? Because women with age present a horizontalization of the ribs and men instead present a horizontalization of the ribs with the increase of the abdominal perimeter. In these cases, an increase of stiffness and fracture vulnerability occurs. Few words about the resuscitation in big size patients. Studies have shown worse outcomes between them. Due to many reasons, this is one of the most difficult resuscitation. The increased slope of the sternum leads to slides of the hands that could produce serious injuries. On the other hand, the ventricular chambers of the obese patients are displaced to the left. We have reported some first favorable results about the safety of a displaced compression, but more data are needed about the safety of a displaced chest compression point that could be optimized using ultrasound images. Now let's take a look at our new results. We studied the chest compression force variation from the mechanical compressor Lucas II, and we found that most of the patients presented a high force variation over time. The high compression force variation was associated with a higher incidence of ribcage damages as bilateral rib fractures. The reason of this is very interesting. Ribcage damages breaks the equilibrium between the elastic and the damping forces of the chest due to a loss of the chest wall elastic force. What are our suggestions? Taking into account the data available to assess the risk and benefit of the chest compression death, and the lower chest height in women, we suggest for older women a chest compression depth between 40 and 50 mm. And for big size patients, such as obese, we suggest that extreme precaution should be taken. Regarding the refractory ventricular fibrillation treatment, the survival decreases with the number of the fibrillation attempts. However, there is a chance of survival even with more than 10 shocks. That's why this has to be balanced considering the benefit of transport to the hospital with ongoing CPR. These findings highlight the need to extend the quality of CPR during the first defibrillation attempts. Regarding the defibrillation treatment, this case shows for the first time the variation of the anti-del C2 and AMSA prior to 12 defibrillation attempts. As you can see, the two returns of a spontaneous circulation of the minute 28 and 39 were preceded by an ascending trend in both curves. We suggest that the real-time analysis of both curve trends could help selecting the timing of defibrillation to avoid unnecessary shocks and improve outcomes. Finally, some words to conclude about variables in personalized research. The patient gender, age, size, the biomechanical behavior of the chest, such as the compression force variation, the hair size and position, and hemodynamic variables 
such as the intrathoracic pressure, need to be taken into account on personalized CPR research. Our research focuses on the biomechanical behavior of the chest, offering a new point of view to improve the effectiveness of CPR. Research to assess CPR injuries harm to preserve cardiac output over time can help guide a more personalized CPR. I think that research on personalized CPR will give us the opportunity to make great improvements in cardiac arrest survival outcomes. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Youssef, for that talk. I'm going to straight away go to the judging panel and Sandra, would you like to ask a question? Of yes, thank you. Thank you, Youssef, for your presentation here. Um, a lot of data in your presentation that are really interesting. And of course, as physicians, as involved in resuscitation, first do no harm. So of course, it's very interesting to start looking at um, is our guidelines, guidelines not individualized enough? And that is interesting. But being the um, education and implementation researcher here, I am curious to how are we going to make this happen in the real world? How can we easily with, and still save time in terms of getting on the chest and doing everything without interruptions? How do we do that benefit? And then in terms of the risks we're running, do you have any ideas and thoughts about that? Thank you very much for your uh, question, Sandra. Um, I think it's a very interesting question. How to implement the individualized CPR and how to teach this? Uh, first of all, I, I have to say that I am not a pedagogic specialist. Then I don't know exactly how to implement into the courses. What I can suggest is, the, is that it could be, we can explore the possibility to introduce some uh, new uh, features into the advanced life support to introduce all the incoming evidence uh, favoring the individualized CPR. I am, I am, I am looking for some ex uh, for some examples such as the electro uh, the the cardiac ultrasound, the utility of the cardiac ultrasound into the the individualized CPR, which is a very great uh, field of investigation and is a very big field to explore and to improve the cardiac arrest performance. But I think that this kind of features, this kind of new intervention in the cardiac and the advanced lab support courses should be directed to, should be directed to uh, teams which are uh, specialized in CPR. I am I am thinking in pre-hospital uh, emergency uh, teams and ECU and uh, CPR teams of, of hospitals. This is, uh, I think I can answer more or less your question, Sandra. So uh, just to understand your answer clearly, so you mean that um, when we're talking about the advanced teams, these considerations need to be brought into the algorithm while we're working? Are we pressing too hard, too deep? or for everyone also when we do bystander CPR out of the hospital? Well, I, I have to say one thing, and one, one thing important before that is that uh, personalized CPR need an amount, uh, a huge amount of data mm -hmm. to be developed. I think that we are only in the, in the start of mm -hmm. this new field of investigation. Mm -hmm. As yesterday says uh, Hanotang in the escape net, uh, session, uh, we have to improve the individualized CPR treatment and the CPR uh, and individualize the, the, the sudden death prevention. But uh, for going through this goal, we have to take into account a very huge, a very, uh, a very big amount of data that we are not able to, 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 to assess uh, until now. Mm. And this is our work for the next years. And uh, we, we, we know not very much, we know a little of the personalized CPR. And uh, what I am in this uh, 
presentation suggesting is a is a very uh, is very little. We are suggesting only uh, a less uh, chest compression death in older women because we know that uh, this is uh, this is harmful for the older woman. We have uh, enough uh, data evidence for saying this, and we are suggesting as well. Uh, to take into account for the for choosing the correct timing of defibrillation, the trend of the AMSA and the anti -the CO2 to avoid um, defibrillations that could be harmless as well. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Cornelia, quick question. Um, you mentioned something about uh, obese patients and that you maybe should change and the place where we uh, perform chest compressions, where would you do, where would you place your hands and would you change also the depth? Yes, uh, Cornelia, thank you very much for your very interesting questions. I think this is not very clearly answered in the bibliography. And uh, my suggestion is that we have to place our hands in the lowest pass part of the sternum. Mm -hmm. Why? Because uh, uh, using this part of the sternum, uh, we use the less force. And, this, and then if we are using less force, we are uh, improving the elasticity characteristics of the chest wall. Okay. Your second part of your question is if, if is if possible to move the hands uh, during the resuscitation of the obese patients. Um, I am thinking in one paper published recently in the resuscitation, who, which uh, highlight the need of the cardiac ultrasound to uh, position, uh, to get the better position of the hands. I think uh, we, don't, we are uh, uh, getting more and more evidence in selecting the best point of positions, but we don't have enough evidence to, to assess the safety of a displaced chest compression point. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you, Cornelia. We're running out of time for Jerry. Uh, I've got a quick question for the audience. Uh, just a very short answer. Have you done any work on children? Any work in children, Yusef? Pediatrics. I think you can't hear me anymore. Um, thank you. We'll close there. So thank you very much, Yusef. And um, we're going to move on to our final speaker for this uh, session in that um, it's uh, Marion Mosby Knapp from Lund in Sweden. She's going to be talking about prediction of neurological outcome after cardiac arrest and targeted temperature management. And we'll speak to her after we see her video. Thank you. Hello, my name is Marion Mosby Knappe and I'm a neurologist at Skåne University Hospital in Lund in Sweden. I would like to thank the organizing committee for the opportunity to present this research for my PhD thesis at the Center of Cardiac Arrest at Lund University. I have no conflicts of interest. Brain injury is common in patients after cardiac arrest. Unconscious patients are usually examined with various methods such as clinical neurological examinations, imaging, EEG, somatosensory evoked potentials, and blood biomarkers. And the combined results of these examinations form the basis for the neurological assessment of presumed outcome. Together with other factors such as comorbidities or cardiac complications, a pessimistic neurological prognosis may lead to withdrawal of life-sustaining therapy, which is usually leading to death of the patient. Therefore, it is essential that the methods used for prediction of neurological outcome are safe. Our research group has previously validated various single prognostic examinations using data from the large TTM trial. My PhD, PhD thesis includes two papers on routine methods for predicting neurological outcome. 
The first examines the prognostic accuracy of head CT, and the second paper assesses the prognostic performance of the ERC ESICM prognostic algorithm. The third and fourth papers, papers explore prognostic accuracies of three novel biomarkers, UCHL1, glial fibrillary acidic protein, and neurofilament light. The we used data collected in the TTM trial, which included 939 adult out-of-hospital cardiac arrest patients who were randomized to a targeted temperature management of either 33 or 36 degrees Celsius. Our serum samples were prospectively collected in the TTM Biobank substudy at 24, 48 and 72 hours post-arrest. The samples were analyzed after trial completion. Primary outcome was assessed by the Cerebral Performance Category Scale after six months. Poor outcome was defined as CPC 3 to 5, ranging from severe cerebral disability, unresponsive wakefulness syndrome or death. In the first study, we retrospectively analyzed local radiologist evaluations of CT scans from 357 patients who were examined on clinical indication. You may know that generalized edema can be seen through a reduced differentiation between a gray and white matter and effacement of the cortical sulci. We found that within the first 24 hours post arrest, the presence of generalized edema identified poor outcome 14% sensitivity and was almost always associated with poor outcome. Sensitivity for outcome prediction increased nearly fourfold to 56% after the first day. And we have two indicators of selective examinations of sicker patients. There was a larger number of poor outcome patients examined with CT after the first day and the levels of neuron-specific enolase were higher in patients who were examined with CT than those who were not. And both CT and NSC are often used for predicting neurological outcome in combination with clinical neurological examinations or neurophysiology. The European Resuscitation Council and the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine guidelines include a prognostic algorithm based on expert opinion. We assess the accuracy of this algorithm with results from prognostic examinations from the TTM trial. 585 patients were included in this retrospective analysis. Our main result was that the ERC ESICM algorithm predicted poor outcome with no false positive predictions in this cohort. The algorithm identified approximately 40% of poor outcome patients. We therefore conclude that the algorithm safely predicts poor outcome, but that the sensitivity is limited. In a sensitivity analysis, we altered the criteria of the algorithm in different ways with the aim of increasing the number of poor outcome patients correctly identified. By including patients with a Glasgow Coma Scale motor score of 3 or less at best flexion posturing on a painful stimulus, we saw that sensitivity increased while 100% specificity of the algorithm remained. The ERC and ESICM recommends a four-step approach when prognosticating, and this may be perceived as somewhat complicated. And we found that even the simplest version of the algorithm, which combined any two prognostic methods, regardless of motor score, <laughs> was safe and also identified approximately 40% of poor outcome patients. In the final two studies, we explored the prognostic potential of three novel biomarkers in samples from 717 patients of the TTM Biobank.
the neuronal body marker UCHL1, and glial fibrillary acidic protein, which are often used together as early markers of traumatic brain injury. Analysis were performed with a commercially available sandwich ELISA. We conclude that GFAP and UCHL1 may be interesting predictors of neurological outcome at 24 hours post arrest. But there is another very interesting marker, and that is the neuroaxonal marker, neurofilament light chain protein, or NFL. Samples from the TTM Biobank were analyzed with an ultra-sensitive SIMOA technique. And we found that serum NFL levels were significantly elevated in poor outcome patients at all time points. And furthermore, NFL is the first brain injury marker where serum concentrations differed between all separate levels of the CPC scale, apart from between CPC4 and CPC5. And this is clinically relevant since NFL may not only differentiate between good and poor outcome, but also indicate the level of neuronal injury. NFL had significantly higher prognostic accuracies than other markers of brain injury, such as neuron-specific NLAs, S100B and tau already at 24 hours. The area under the curve was 0.94. At matched specificities, NFL identified a larger number of poor outcome patients than any routine method recommended by the ERC and ESICM algorithm. So we conclude CT with generalized edema was highly associated with poor outcome, but there were false positive predictions. The ERC and ESICM algorithm safely predicts poor outcome, but the sensitivity of the algorithm is limited. Serum NFL at 24 hours had higher prognostic accuracy than any routine method, and NFL differentiated between various degrees of brain injury. And in future, this may be useful to prevent premature VLST in patients who have a potentially good neurological prognosis. There are limitations to our studies. The TTM trial was primarily designed to compare target temperature management and not neuroprognostication. We know there is selection bias and neuroimaging and somatosensory evoked potentials were performed on clinical indication, usually in sicker patients. The TTM trial protocol and the ERC ESICM algorithm have partly overlapping criteria uh, for prognostication, and we cannot exclude any potential effects of self fulfilling prophecies. Uh, some co authors have participated in the TTM steering group and the guidelines. And I would like to thank all co-authors and the TTM trial investigators and also the funders. And I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Marianne. Can you uh, turn on your camera, please? Uh, I can't because it says the host has stopped it. So, um, unfortunately. Okay. Yes. We'll, we'll start asking you questions and uh, hopefully we can yeah, see there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Cornelia, first questions. Yes, I have a, a more general question. If you would have um, 1 million euros, um, what would be your next study? Oh, that's, uh, I, I would love to, <laughs> to answer that question. No, I think my favorite study at the moment uh, would would lie in the biomarker section, I think. So I would uh, I would uh, have a, a large prospective biomarker study uh, with sampling from baseline shortly after cardiac arrest, and then follow the patients up until uh, maybe weeks or months post arrest, because biomarkers seem to be incredibly dynamic, um, and uh, even if we have several biomarkers that um, could be excellent predictors of neurological outcome, the 
the optimal timing for each of them uh, is not that clear yet. So I think uh, to understanding the, the uh, dynamics of each biomarker and also the influence of the, uh, the uh, diagnostic methods used uh, mm -hmm. would be very, um, very interesting for me, I'd say. And if you say biomarkers, you would only use blood biomarkers or cerebral spinal fluid or would you... Well, um, there, there are, have been some studies, not only cardiac arrest patients, but, but also to demonstrate that blood biomarkers are quite good and correlate well with the, the cerebral spinal fluid. So I think uh, due to the risks um, and uh, the possible complications of uh, lumbar puncture, I would uh, choose biomarkers from the blood. Yes, okay. Um, I have no further questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Cornelia. I'm going to go straight to Jerry. And uh, Jerry, any questions? Yeah, Marion, thanks. Um, really interesting piece of work, multiple bits of work. Um, I'm interested in, in early generalised cerebral edema, and you quite rightly said that was associated with a, with a very poor prognosis. But if I understood your data correctly, it wasn't universally a poor prognosis. There, there appeared to be some patients that that survived with a good outcome from, from what you presented. Was that true? That's right. Uh, there are there were two false positive predictions, uh, and both were within the first twenty four hours. Um, and I, the thing is, with with this uh, descriptive study, we had no access to the original images, um, so we do not know how the interrate variability would have been or how it was, and if. Uh, all the radiologists would have evaluated the same uh, generalized edema. Uh, but um, we are doing a pilot study from Swedish sites of TTM1 to prepare analysis for our uh, sub-study in TTM2, where we will uh, and, uh, well, examine interrate variability between various radiologists, and then we can see how um, how much does it differ between radiologists? And then we'll try to validate not only uh, eyeballing uh, of generalized edema, but also various manual and automated measurements of GBR. Uh, so I hope that we will see um, or get more answer to that in the next few years. And then also, of course, um, even the development of cerebral edema is a dynamic process. So even though there may be, well, the sensitivity was uh, higher at a later time point and also uh, explained by selective extermination of poorer patients. Um, I think that uh, the uh, overall, um, let's say, incidence of uh, edema also develops and increases over time. So that's probably a combination and uh, also has importance for how uh, the prognostic accuracy will be of the examinations. Thanks, Marion. I'll, I'll hand you back to, ja uh, to Jazz in case there's um, slider questions. There are, there are some questions about NFL. So uh, was there any difference between the two TTM targets for NFL between 33 and 36? Um, n not for the prognostic accuracy, no. So they're, um, they're, as, they're as accurate uh, in both uh target temperature groups. And does it come from all nerves or just the brain, NFL? Uh, well, it? NFL is also, it's, so in the, in the CNS, it's present in the large myelinated axons, uh, but it is also in the peripheral nerve system. So if somebody has a critical illness, polyneuropathy, then the NFL levels could, of course, be increased as well. Um, and also, of course, other CNS um, um, well, see conditions like ALS or um, multiple sclerosis or stroke, even though we see that the concentrations are uh, just a fraction of those of uh, poor outcome patients uh, after cardiac arrest. So it's not very likely to interfere, but more uh, studies are needed on that as well. Okay, I'm going to stop there on asking questions. And uh, I'd like to say well done to all the young investigators. I'd like to thank um, all, all the speakers involved in the session. Hopefully they'll all come up on your screen now. So 
Well, well done all. We've had a great session. We're going to end this session now for those of you on the live stream. Sorry we couldn't take all your questions, but there's a great session on resuscitation in sports starting in five minutes. And that's on the on the on the platform for the Congress, but also free on the ERC YouTube channel. And then in an hour from now is the closing ceremony. And that's where Jerry Nolan will be announcing the results of a young investigator competition. There's a great prize, which is a year on the editorial board of the journal Resuscitation. And um, two years, I think, Chance. Two years, two years, even better, two years on the editorial board of, yeah, of uh, Resuscitation. So thank you all very much and uh, well done, everybody.